Welcome to SEC 211. My name is Reena Nedkarni. I'm the product lead for security and analytics on G Suite. Today, we are going to have with us a couple of my colleagues, uh, Panos, as well as Mitch, who are going to help us, and then also a really cool customer story with Joy. So I'm very excited about this session. Before we dive deep, let's start by understanding why this area is important and why it matters. Google recently did a study with over 4,000 customers that told us that security even today across vendors is a number one barrier to, move to, to moving to cloud, to upgrading to the cloud, right? And we also found out that irrespective of geos, consistently security shows up as one of the top three needs along with things like reliability that they care about. So that's why for us, security and privacy is a huge area of focus. But why is this really so difficult? First of all, companies are rapidly moving to the cloud. As you can imagine, they're using more and more applications and more devices. I read some stats somewhere that it was about 1,400 services per large company that they're using. So you can imagine it's really hard to manage all these services. Secondly, there's constant issues with updating patches and such with your legacy systems. And then the security attacks are on the rise. So if you combine all of these together, managing your environment is really very challenging. So today we are going to look at what we are doing both in Chrome as well as in G Suite to help you manage this better. Before we go down that path, I want to call upon an expert. Panos Mavromatis is an engineering director at Google Cloud. He runs the Google Cloud Safe Browsing team, and he's worked at Google on identifying phishing and malware sites for over 13 years. His papers on phishing and malware have over 2,000 citations. So at Google, we just basically call him an underachiever. <laughs> Panos? Thanks, Rina. So as Rina mentioned, I'm the engineering director for Google Safe Browsing, which is a group of teams at Google that fights phishing and malware across the web, email, as well as our platforms. Uh, I actually joined in the Safe Browsing team as an engineer in 2006, so I was able to see uh, the threat landscape as well as our defenses evolve all those years. So today I'm excited to share some of those trends with you. For over 10 years, and for 10 years before that, Google has been doing one thing really well, which is to crawl the web, right? Uh, what our team does is crawl the web looking for bad sites. Here we present how many new malware sites we detect each week in the blue line and how many new phishing sites we detect each week, again, in the red line. And this goes back all the way since 2009. Uh, so first with the good news is that exploit-based malware has been dropping, particularly since 2016. The primary reason for that has been the security work that was, that was done by the awesome Chrome team uh, over the last decade that made browsers really more secure against exploits. Uh, features like automatic updates and sandboxing of the rendering engine have basically made these attacks extremely hard. The, I wish I could say the same for phishing, but as you can see, Phishing has actually grown uh, compared to 10 years ago. We still detect over 30,000 new uh, phishing domains each week. And actually, the previous graph doesn't show the full picture. The malware ex exploits have dropped, but malware is still around, and malware still finds its way to users. It just uses a different method of delivery. It asks the user to download and run the file themselves. Um, last year, we showed twice as many download warnings in Chrome as in 2016. Even when we look at software downloads from Chrome Enterprise users, one half of a percent of every file download that could be carrying an application or other software is flagged by Google Safe Browsing every single day. Talking about scale and la, uh, scale and volume of attacks, Gmail detects and protects Google users from over 100 million phishing emails each day. 
When we look back at our defenses against these threats over the last 10 years, we have learned a few lessons. Um, sharing them today, because I think they can be helpful if you're either building your own defenses or choosing a platform to partner with that comes with those defenses built in. The first lesson we learn is that very often the cost of defenses can be disproportionately higher than the cost of attacks. Uh, you can imagine why that's a problem. To give you an example and add some color to that, evading a classifier can be done very easily. Right? For example, you experiment, change your email a few times, change the file a few times until it's no longer detected and goes through. If on the other hand you're on the defense side and your job is to build a classifier that will be evasion resistant to every past and every future attack that has ever been created and will be created, um, you should not take that job. Uh, it is an NP hard problem proven by academia and anyone in the industry will tell you that, yes, that's not possible. Plus, the more targeted the attack is, the more expensive it is to defend against it. High volume attacks, uh, they even though they can reach a lot of people, they actually carry a very loud signal with them, which is like their volume. Uh, so defenders can use volume to prioritize and uh, defend against these attacks. Low volume attacks on the other on the other side, such as spear phishing or targeted malware, they tend to fly under the radar. And to build classifiers that catch those gets expensive, more and more expensive. Machine learning is extremely important in our industry, uh, specifically for, for security, especially in this space. It can make a big difference in reducing, for example, our time to react to changes automatically. Um, this allows us to build the, more, the most evasion and resistant engines we can. However, um, one thing that we found to be true, uh, and we've been using machine learning since 2008 to classify both phishing and malware on the web, is that we really need to invest in the training data quality. Uh, what we call ground truth, which is the both the labels and the data itself, the freshness of the data, uh, all of that me goes into the model quality. Um, and so the lesson here was that you really need to invest in the ongoing process of maintaining the quality of the data. Uh, 90, 95 percent of your effort will go into that, as opposed to picking the latest and greatest ML algorithm. User education or employee training is something that is common and it can be useful. It can reduce the likelihood that a particular user may click on a particular phishing link. In our experience, this does not solve the problem. If you think about how training is delivered uh, often to employees, uh, we send them a very urgent email then we ask them to click on a link, then they go through some kind of authentication dance and they probably enter their corporate password on a site they've never seen before, only to land on a page that tells them never to click on emails and never to enter their corporate password on a site they've never seen before. Right? Uh, and then it tries to explain to them how to parse URLs with their eyes. Right? So you need to find the third slash and then go back two dots, sometimes three dots, and then that's the domain you're on. And so URLs were built for computers, and even computers have trouble parsing URLs sometimes. Uh, how can we expect, uh, let's say, a nurse that is finishing their shift to be able to uh, determine if a phishing link is coming from a trusted source or if the domain is actually valid? Um, in general, what we found is that we're, we're working with those very old and open ecosystems, the web, email, desktop operating systems. These have been so incredibly successful, everyone uses them every day because they were open. So we need to do two things. First, work with these, op with these platforms. We can't just dream of the future and ignore the, the present. But we also want to build the platforms of the future that have security built into them. That's pretty much our strategy in, in, in this space. Um, for building the best and fastest 
reactive, uh, reactive and proactive detections on the platforms that our users are on. Uh, our best hope is to leverage our end-to-end -end visibility for web and email, as well as Google scale to produce, to protect the platforms our users are currently using. Next, we want to build the next generation of platforms, which are actually designed with security in mind. I'll give an example, a very quick example of how we leverage our visibility to protect users on the web and email. Some Chrome users opt in to sharing security-related threat data with Google. When Chrome detects something suspicious, such as typing your password on a website that you've never seen, been before, uh, Google is uh, able to quickly classify these sites. And this could be brand new phishing sites that no one has ever seen before. If they are confirmed, then we can push that data to Gmail and Gmail will filter the emails that contain those links before they reach the user's inbox. So to summarize, I've shared the current threat landscape as, uh, from Google's unique vantage point. I've shared some of the lessons we learned uh, while building defenses against them and how critical our end-to-end -end visibility has been. Now, I want to pass back to Rina, share how G Suite and Chrome take advantage of these technologies and provide additional security features to help you protect your employees and your users. Thank you, Bonos. That was insightful. With the advances in malware and phishing detection, we believe that a truly cloud-native solution like G Suite and Chrome Enterprise can help you secure your company better. It can improve your company's security posture. We believe that we also don't want to force fit a solution on our customers. We want to be able to meet them where they are. So today, along with data that Pano shared and some of the insights and lessons learned, I'm going to share with you some of the defenses that we have to help you uh, in your journey to the cloud. A simple way to think about our defenses in G Suite is that we want them to be proactive, intelligent, compliant, and simple. Let's kind of dive deep into each of these very quickly. So proactive. The admins that manage these large corporations are really busy, and cybersecurity skills are very hard to come by. So what we want to try to do is without the admin having to do anything at all, we have proactive defenses in place. So things like polymorphic mal malware, things like um, being able to detect ransomware that uh, Panos talked about. We're very proud of our record of security on Gmail. When you think about intelligent, we really think about how to bring better machine learning insights to be able to show you all of these alerts together and easier in one spot. Our alert center allows admins to manage these alerts in one, in one spot and take actions on these alerts. Last year, we announced the G Suite Security Center, and I think it's useful to dive into that for a second. The G Suite Security Center helps an admin go from prevention, detection, and remediation of all of your security issues. So first of all, before you do anything, like I said, in one spot, you get a complete view of your organization's security picture. We also show you a single page where we give you all of G Suite security setting in one spot, and we also show you if you're deviating from Google recommended best practices in those security settings. So that's really helpful. And then finally, we have the security investigation tool that allows you to quickly remediate these incidences. But what about compliance? Google's practices and data handling practices and such are audited by third party auditors across the globe. So when you come to Google, we want to make sure that we are helping you in your compliance journey. So for example, the ISO 27001 is a really good example of a difficult to get certification. So we are here, we're helping you on your compliance journey. And then what commitments do we make to our customers? Let's be clear about those. First of all, no ads. Google does not use your data in G Suite for ads purposes. Your data does not get scanned for ads purposes at all. Secondly, you own your data. So G Suite customers can take their data and leave at any time through takeout. Um, your apps are accessible, so we have SLAs around that. And finally, 
you can delete your data. You stay in control of your own data. So these are commitments that we make to our customers. And security is only as useful. All these tools that we make available to you are only as useful as if people really begin to use these tools. And so we want to keep the security tools really, really simple for our admins. A couple of quick examples of that. The first one is that we have one console, a single console from which you can manage all of your admin security and other, including your devices all together. With this centralized management console, we have people tell us that I used to use this other system before and it had 14 different consoles. And we really believe in keeping things simple for the admins because they're so overwhelmed with this amount of data. Along with our admin console for G Suite, you also get cloud identity, which allows you to bring in identity from other parties. And we have our mobile device management solution, which has seen a huge amount of adoption with our customers, both for Android and for iOS, our mobile device management. One of my favorite features of our MDM is that it allows you to do agentless monitoring of devices. So what that means is if someone adds your G Suite account to a device without them having to download anything at all. Their, your account is protected and you get access to enforce a password and to do an account wipe, not a full device wipe, right? You don't want to be deleting pictures, uh, you know, baby pictures off of somebody's phone, but you can do just a G Suite account wipe off of their phone uh, the minute they add a G Suite account to the phone. So that's sort of really convenient, very simple way to get control over your corporate data. Data regions. So with, the, with our geo-dispersed data centers, G Suite actually, most of our customers don't want to regionalize their data. They uh, enjoy the red high redundancy and latency that G Suite provides. However, some of our customers are under um, certain regulations for which they cannot have their data leave EU or uh, leave the US. So for that, we launched data regions uh, really simple, adaptable. Um, so if I create an account, uh, if I create a document and I am based in EU, and then I transfer the ownership of that document to say Panos, who's based in the US, automatically the data regions policy will adapt to that change in ownership. This year, we're also including things like backups and new uh, G Suite services like forms and sites in our data regions offering. So I'm very excited about that. There's many customers that are using both Chrome Enterprise as well as G Suite to uh, manage their um, corporate IT. We have Veolia, we have Whirlpool and others. But instead of showing you just these logos, what I thought would be a really good idea is for you to hear firsthand from a customer what their journey was like. So for that, I'm going to call Joey Smith. It's my great honor to invite jo Joey on stage Joey is the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Schnucks. He was brought in to build a more mature information security program in the wake of a very public and catastrophic breach. He is joining us all the way from St. Louis, Missouri. Joey, welcome. Yeah, as Rena said, my name is Joey Smith. I'm the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Schnook Markets. And I've given this particular presentation or a version of it in a number of different settings. And I got to tell you, this is the first time I've ever done it in a movie theater. And you all look very comfortable. Uh, so what I want to talk you through is a bit about uh, who Schnooks is. I've met a lot of different folks over the last two days. And so far, no one's known the company that I work for, and that just to, to us, that just means you're probably not from the St. Louis area because Schnooks is very relevant and large in the St. Louis area, but uh, we don't have any any stores on the East or West Coast. So let me go a bit into who Schnooks is and what it is that we're doing and, and ultimately what led us to our decision to move G Suite and now further as we explore what GCP can do for us as a business. But since I'm going to talk about um, a, a public breach, as Rena mentioned, I do always, uh, my attorneys ask that I open and just let everyone know that these opinions are mine. They're not uh, representative of my employers. 
Uh, this also accounts for any employer I used to work for. I used to work for MasterCard, and they used to also have me say this anytime we go up and talk about merchants or any type of breach events. So with that being said, I somehow now have the green light to go kind of give you guys a bit of a behind the curtains view of what happened to Schnooks and how we ended up responding to that. So first off, let me talk a bit about Schnook Markets and, and the industry that we're in and the business that we do. So Schnook Markets has been around for about 79 years now. We're coming up on our 80th anniversary. We were founded in 1939 and we're a third generation family owned grocery retailer. We have at this point, as of about six months ago, we have now about 120 stores across the Metro St. Louis area and surrounding states, Missouri, Indiana, Iowa, and uh, Wisconsin and Illinois. Uh, we employ over 15,000 teammates across all those stores. We also have pharmacies in all of our stores. Um, we're actually the 48th largest food retailer in North America and the country's 17th largest privately held grocery store. Uh, more recently, we've launched a Schnooks Rewards program, uh, a mobile app where you can now shop and get points for all your purchases, and then you can cash those points in for money off of your current basket that's going through. That's been wildly successful, and we are on track in the first six to nine months here to have over a million of our customers on that platform. So now we're getting more and more data that we've never had before about our customers, what they shop, where they shop, what they're buying, those types of things that we can leverage tools like Google Cloud Platform to draw some very very powerful insights into how we can specifically target those employees and give them experiences that they're asking for. One of the things that attracted me to Schnooks was what it is that they do in the communities that we serve. So we're very proud. We, we offer our customers what we call an eScripts program. This is a program that you as a customer of Schnooks can go in and you can set which local charity you would like to donate a certain percentage of your shop to. So this allows our customers to pick uh, organizations that are relevant to them. For example, my wife and I, we pick uh, the school that, that our kids go to just down the road from us. And so a certain percentage of what we spend at Schnooks goes directly into the communities that we serve. So it's not necessarily this big giant corporate initiative where you know maybe it's the corporate company has chosen United Way. And while as a customer I could choose United Way, I would rather put that more locally into my community. So we're very proud that we donate more than $2 million annu annually to these types of programs across all of the St. Louis and regions that we operate in. This is, uh, again, one of the things that, that attracted me to Schnooks because it's something that um, us giving back really helps us understand and put our customer first, which is very important to us. So as ingrained into the community as Schnooks is and has everyone that shops there can appreciate that, that they know that their money is going to some non-for-profits that, that they appreciate. And while we're all over the map in St. Louis um, and as local as we are, uh, like all of you in the audience, we also maintain a global security threat. And let me take you back through um, a bit of our history and really going back to the year 2013. This was the year that Symantec, uh, Symantec named the year of the mega breach. And I have some of these numbers up here and I won't read them out loud, but uh, you can see this is really the year that breaches really started to hockey stick. Now you look at some of these numbers and compare them to the numbers today, and this is like really nothing. But this was the year that information security was really put on the map and chief information security officers and cybersecurity teams started to get a lot more attention. They weren't really in the back of the bus anymore. They were coming to the forefront because all this stuff was happening. And at this time, I was working for MasterCard and we were doing analytics on breach merchants because we were able to see uh, we were able to see the fraud data and we could correlate that to what we called a common point of purchase and we could identify the merchant that was ultimately bleeding the credit card data, merchants like Target and Home Depot. Well, this was actually before Target and Home Depot, but this was um, uh, this was that year wherever the, the, the hackers that were out in the world started to recognize and realize the vulnerabilities of merchant systems and the lucrative nature of that magnetic stripe data that goes through uh, those systems. By March 2013, or I should say really in December 2012, Schnucks fell victim to one of these statistics. And little did the company know, but in December of 2012, um, a hacker had gained unauthorized access to our systems, put some malware on our point of sale systems, and began ciphering credit card data out of our environment. Uh, it was by March of 2013 that there was an incredible amount of media activity around this. Um, the media plays no, gives no favors to merchants that are breached and really loves to throw them under the bus. And it was something, one of those catastrophic moments in our company's history 
um, that we weren't necessarily prepared to respond to at the time. So as I think back again, I was, St. Louis is a baseball town and the Cardinals just started and, and like all good St. Louis folks, I was sitting on the couch one day watching the St. Louis Cardinals play a game. It went to commercial break and the first commercial that popped up was the CEO of Schnook sitting on a chair, suit and tie, on the edge of tears, literally taking commercial time out to apologize to the entire city of St. Louis. I'm sorry, St. Louis, we lost your trust. Um, we are committed to winning that trust back. It was unbelievable. You don't see that type of stuff today. So the, the picture I'm trying to paint is this was before there was really a, a, uh, a playbook on how to respond to these types of events. So it was at this time we were just seeing this incredible amount of negative publicity in the news constant front page story of all the local St. Louis networks running this. We're running commercials to apologize for this event. And we were absolutely besides ourselves. So as a consumer and just a customer of Schnucks, I was absolutely floored. And particularly as somebody in the information security field who had, who, who has been dedicating their career towards, towards uh, risk mitigation and things of that nature, I couldn't believe the amount of press that Schnucks was getting around this event. And again, I go back to this was before Target and this was before Home Depot and, you know, oh my goodness, Equifax puts all of these numbers to shame. But uh, this was something that really pushed the company to the edge of, edge of how are we going to start to respond to this. And one of the things that was interesting to me as I interviewed for the job as their first named chief information security officer was they made a declaration and they told me, we are going to look at this event and we're not going to let it define us. We're going to allow this event to become our finest hour. We're going to learn from this event and we're going to use our learnings to be able to go out into the communities that we serve and further, like Google Next, for example, and be able to tell our story and talk to whether it's our customers or other folks in the IT and security field about what we did and how we survived and how we came out of this. So let me tell you a bit about that story and more specifically, given the theme of this conference, what we ended up doing from a, from a Google perspective. So around this time, uh, I ended up taking the job. I s began to deploy a, a risk and threat-based security strategy where we were no longer just focusing on compliance and making sure we were PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant. And we began to hire a team and move people internally to come over to my group to really start to identify threat and risk and look at our security posture through those lens. At one point, maybe about a year and a half or so into my journey as the chief information security officer there, we actually did have an event where a piece of ransomware landed on one of our internal servers. And fortunately, because of some of the security controls that we had been putting in place, it didn't do anything. Our security controls detected it and it did not install. However, it did breach our perimeter. It got in and it landed on one of our servers. Mike Kissel's uh, on my team. He's the senior manager of Endpoint and Cloud Security. Mike came into my office that day after we looked at that and we were kind of wiped our brow and said, thank God that that didn't install because had it installed, it would have encrypted all of our unstructured data, which is where our Microsoft Exchange server sat um, in, in that particular data center. And he came up to me and he asked me this very serious question. And this was the question that was a, a key moment in our decision as we started to look at different ways to protect our data and our customer data. And he asked me this. He said, are you confident, Joey, enough in this detection and response strategy that we've been deploying? Are you confident enough that you right now can walk into our CEO's office, Mr. Schnook's office, and tell him that if a ransomware attack hit our exchange server, uh, that he can fire you? And I was like, well, absolutely not. We just dodged this one bullet. We were lucky that our endpoint controls actually detected that and stopped it. So no, there'd be no way that I can tell you that I would be confident enough to walk into his office and say, our exchange servers can survive a ransomware attack. There's no way. And he goes, well, I can tell you how. I said, well, let's start talking. So this is the beginning of the introduction of what Google can mean for a retailer like Schnucks. So we began to look at Google and we looked at it, obviously I was looking at it through the lens of security and what do we gain by moving some of our more valuable corporate assets and data, unstructured data, as well as email, calendar, and, and those types of things into Google Cloud. Uh, under the lens of security and looking at what's their security posture look like and what's the funding that they give to their security teams and how do they do encryption versus all those same questions on my side. And it was a clear winner that I can't put in the amount of security budget or security stack that a company like Google can, a company that's focused more so on security than a local privately held 
retailer. So after um, a lot of collaboration with the different business units and looking at it through my lens, and they began to look through it through the lens of collaboration, how can we more effectively run store operations and things of that nature, all the other senior leadership team at Schnooks ended up making the decision that G Suite was the right move to go. So I'm going to talk now, and this is where I'll close, on the three major learnings that we have had. And we've been on G Suite now for, for right over two years. And what it is that we learned in this rollout and some of the things that went well, actually, I'll be very honest, some of the things that didn't go so well, um, and some of the things that we never expected. So first, let's see, what went well for us? We moved to Google, uh, like I said, two years ago, and prior to doing that, um, I talked about some of the other senior leaders uh, that we engaged in this move. So it wasn't just something, another thing from Joey's team who's hearing the word yes a lot, because you know we come off of a breach, they're gonna let me spend the money that we need to spend to help mitigate that risk. Um, let's get the weigh-in from some of the other business units. So we partnered with members of IT infrastructure, store operations, digital marketing, digital marketing, legal, asset protection, HR communication, my group and information security, and created a steering committee around this initiative, making sure that what Google could offer us could also help solve problems and allow them to operate the way that they're used to and potentially even more effectively. We started a tech team. We issued a very robust training program around that. Um, one of the things that I loved so much about Google was literally overnight once we turned Google G Suite on, I was able to roll out two-factor authentication uh, within just a click of a button to our end users. It was absolutely amazing. I can't talk about the importance of two-factor authentication enough from a security perspective. Google lets me, lets us do that seem absolutely seamlessly. It was a beautiful thing, particularly when you look at some of the other offerings of how much they cost and how much they cost to deploy. Um, two-factor just being included is 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 impressive by Google. I thank Google for that for sure. Um, the immediate collaboration that we began to see across the stores. I tell the story of we had a, a older lady store manager and her job every Monday morning was to take an Excel sheet and uh, and put all of the P&Ls across all the stores that were in her division. So that's maybe like 25 stores. So she would get her store and then 24 other email attachments of the same stupid Excel file with their, with not, with their P&Ls in it. And she'd have to open every single one, you know, control C their data, then go to the other one and control V, copy, paste, copy, paste 24 other times into a master file, save it, attach it, send it up the chain of command to the division manager who would then look at it and have all that data. It was just absolutely ridiculous and it's this very Microsoft-y uh, way to do things. Well, once we rolled out Google G Suite, it was one shared sheet across that entire division. Um, they can now do them on their mobile devices. They can update. And the coolest, one of the coolest quotes that I got back from that group was that now I can do this. What used to take me 20, 30, 40 minutes every Monday morning, I can do in five minutes on my phone, on the sales floor with my customers where I need to be, not upstairs off of the sales floor. Um, and, and the, the most beautiful part of that story was these weren't technical teammates. These are just teammates that were able to figure out this collaboration tool and start using it to, to get some of the more busy work type stuff out of the way in a collaborative format. Moving on, here's some of the things that failed. I talked about two factors. So we are a proud union employer um, in, in the St. Louis area. The union does have contracts about you're not allowed to use cor uh, anything corporate on my personal cell phone. So while you could probably argue, I think us tech-minded people in the, in the crowd here today, we could probably argue that with Google Authenticator, uh, you're not actually doing any corporate data. We're not calling your AT&T or Verizon. We're not charging you for text messages, given those. But we couldn't push out two-factor to their personal devices, and that was okay. So we were able to solve that through the uh, UB keys that, that we talked about a bit for anti-phishing and things like that. So we can still have the two-factor, but it wasn't as easy and wasn't something that we necessarily considered was the union aspect of that. Um, limited number of, sh of people that can get into a shared inbox has been a bit of a challenge for us where... Uh, in a in general inbox in Google, you can share it with, I think it's like 20, 25 people. Um, well, our stores have sometimes over 100 teammates, so basically we're left with the store managers to pick their favorite 25, and those are the ones that have access to that store inbox. That's an easy fix, something that we've, you know, told Google about, and very simple for them to be able to up that. We're just waiting for that, that new release. Uh, let's see. Executive admins are a hard group to please. <laughs> so they schedule meetings and it's different. You know, it's one of those things we talk about change management. Some of the things that we did well was working with uh, our partners of ours at Augusto to work through this change management. How do we address that? 
Um, make sure you pay attention to your executive admins. They are the direct line to your C-level employees. And what they say is what your C-level employees believe. And if they have a bad time scheduling an appointment because they're not used to something, then ultimately this incredible product can get a negative connotation and it's not always fair. So uh, we did learn that we need to spend a lot more time with our executive admins. They're not necessarily the most technical people. They love to listen, they love to partner with us, but at the end of the day, they are very difficult to please. Um, also with training, we had a really good training program. We made it very simple using the Google tools for people to sign up. We did video content. We recorded the meetings. We did a lot of the same things we're seeing here with the keynotes where they were either streamed live or you could watch the video later. Um, and then ultimately it was just trying to get people hungry enough to go seek out that training on their own is also very difficult. Things that we never expected. It was surprisingly challenging. I was mostly excited about Google, obviously, because of the security wins that I get from the two-factor to the encryption, data in motion, data at rest, data out of my environment. Um, uh, but it was a lot more difficult to get our end users excited about something that to them was just simply perceived as a new calendar and email tool. And I say time and time again, whenever I talk to our Schnook teammates, that if we bought, we did not buy Google for calendar and email. I really honestly don't care that much about calendar e or email. Uh, those things are relatively commodity in my opinion. Uh, it's all the other tools that Google G Suite offers us that empowers us as employees and empowers us as a business. Google or email and calendar being part of that. Uh, but it was amazingly challenging to get it past the mind of what does drive mean and what, how, do, how, how can I use Hangouts versus sending an email? What does uh, collaboration in Sheets, Docs, Slides, and those types of things? Um, really positive ROI on the reduction of our spam filter that used to sit in front of our exchange environment. And I know we talked about it a bit in the session about what Google's doing in spam and it is, uh, again, just lights out better than any of the competition that we had seen. And we, and we did have a spam provider that we had in front of our exchange environment. Uh, once we moved to Google G Suite, we saw that that went quiet because Google was already taking care of it and we were able to sever our relationship with that spam provider saving us a very, very significant amount of money annually on that. We just let Google take care of the spam for us now. Again, all included as part of the G Suite package. Um, I talk about users' technical knowledge or lack thereof. That's not something to underestimate. To us, it's very easy. You know, you click the blue button that says send, and guess what it does? It sends the email. Uh, that's not always as uh, understandable by, by some of our end users, and we were literally coaching them through some of what we kind of take for granted as technically minded folks. Um, so there was there is a lot of lack of technical knowledge, and it probably is more rooted in resistance to change. Where um, you know we've had we've had funny stories where people are very adamant they don't want to get out of Excel, so so they won't go to Sheets. And the reasons that we're hearing are just like laughable. Where we we heard we heard a lady talk about I don't want to move to Sheets because I don't trust the math. We're like, well, two plus two still equals four in Sheets, just like it does in Excel. So moving and, and help moving that needle from a technical perspective is, is also something that we didn't expect. And, and I talk about Excel and how deep our love for Excel goes. And, and that's very true. We have um, a, a deep spider web network of Excel files. And I imagine that probably most of you in, in your businesses do as well. Um, Google does a great job of, in most cases, transitioning those Excel files to Sheets. And what we ask our end users is as you create new content, create in G Suite and move forward, older stuff. But um, we're moving further and further away from Excel as we're trying to lessen our dependency on Microsoft. But it's definitely been a challenge and, uh, and, and something that you should definitely keep in mind as you consider moving your business to G Suite. So those are some high level things what went well, what failed and what we never expected. Uh, this was the decision that we made in a post breach environment um, in Google G Suite has been a fantastic decision from my perspective as the information security officer to reduce risk, help us with threats, stop spam, stop uh, phishing attacks. And it's been something that uh, I've been very proud to help lead that way at Schnooks. And it's been one of those differentiating tools as we look to continue to uh, mitigate our attack service and lessen our overall security risk so that those types of events that we incurred in 2012 and 2013 never happen again for us. So that's our story. I appreciate you guys listening to me. Thank you, Google, for having me out here to share that. And Rena, I'll hand it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Joey. You know, our mission is to really change and make work better for as many people as possible. And so hearing stories like what Joey did with his companies um, 
you know, upgrading to G Suite um, is really heartwarming to hear. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, I'm going to next run through some quick launches, what's new this year and what we are launching. And then Mitch is going to show you a quick demo and we'll close the session out. Okay. So first in our set of launches is access transparency. The blog just went out, but this is an exciting area for us. As customers, even large customers that, you know, in some areas compete with Google, move to G Suite. We want to make sure that they're fully comfortable with what G Suite does and does not do with their data. We never access a customer's data for anything other than meeting our contractual obligations to them. Sometimes, for example, when customers call us for doing something like technical support, Googlers do need to look at your data to help you uh, mitigate those issues. But what we're launching with Access Transparency is that every single such access will be logged and you will be able to file a ticket if you have a question about why someone accessed your data. And this is sort of industry leading in terms of how much transparency we're giving you for every single clear text access by a human being at Google. So that's access transparency for you. The next one is to collaborate um, on you know, your security journeys. So what we have found is that most large companies have a team of admins that work together. Right? So first of all, we're giving them the ability to create automatic, um, automated alerts, to take actions, remediative actions on any kind of alerts that they get. And the second thing is that when you work together as a team of admins, you may have the way they collaborate together is very archaic. And we're trying to build G Suite style collaboration, the example that Joey just gave, right? Even in the admin security journeys. So for example, I come in early and I have an investigation that I'm looking at and then the next admin comes in and they want to be able to follow along. I don't have to take screenshots and then message them to them or email them. I can share the investigation as a view only investigation and the other admin can follow along. This is going to be a great game changer for our admins because no one's really thought about their user journeys in this way. So I'm very excited about this. We also want to provide simple access anywhere you are. So if you are seeing there's a theme here, right? We want the data to be secure, but we do not want security to get in the way of your employees as they look to be productive in their day job. So context aware access is a huge win in this area. What this allows you to do is that every single access that is required for your um, apps or your infrastructure is vetted specifically for that access, depending on where the person is, what kind of device they're using and things like that. There are many signals that feed into it. And so that context aware access is also launching in beta now. And then we, like I said before, for data regions, we're adding additional uh, new products like forms and sites. And uh, we will allow you to store both your primary data and backups in the place that you want. With that, I'm going to call Mitch Christo, my colleague, to come and show you a demo of some of these technologies. Mitch. Awesome. Thank you, Rena. Hello, everyone. Um, so with the increasing complexities um, that the corporate environments are facing um, and the ever-growing list of threats, our security professionals are really more and more burdened. So I want to show you a couple of examples of products and features um, that Google's rolling out in order to provide you with uh, tools that make it easier to use, provide scalability, and also offer uh, best practices on the security front. Uh, can you switch, please, the uh, input? Thank you. All right. Um, within the uh, security admin tool, uh, for example, you have the ability now um, to see all of your security-related settings on a single page as it pertains to all of the G Suite settings. So with uh, that ease of use, we give you a very simple way of seeing all of your security settings in a single location and also follow along to see what are the recommendations that we provide uh, for you to improve the uh, security setup or also give you uh, the... Um, ability to see that you've actually set up all of the uh, security-related practices that, that we recommend. So depending on the settings, um, you have a, a very simple and scalable way to actually view everything that's going on within the resources that you provide. 
Again, this all, uh, offers all the administrators uh, a single page to uh, see all of your settings, save time, and centrally manage all of your security-related settings. In addition to the uh, resource settings, we also offer you the ability to manage um, access via devices. Right? More and more people bring their own devices to the corporate environment, and you have to control all of these devices um, in a scalable and easy-to-use fashion. Um, and what we provide there is the ability to do agentless mobile device management. So if somebody shows up and brings their device, um, you have the ability, and I'm going to use here my own personal device, uh, to connect, for example, to corporate resources. And automatically, without me having to install anything on my device, I show up uh, within the device management. There's no software to push, no approvals to perform. Um, and I now, as an administrator, have the ability to control that device remotely. Uh, so again, offering you the ease of use, uh, as well as scalability to handle um, any kind of device setup um, that your users may actually bring to the table. And here you can enforce uh, all your policies. Uh, as Rina said earlier, wipe the data uh, that is uh, specifically pertaining to uh, G Suite uh, or just disconnect the device altogether. OK. Um, but within our environment, um, you also have to control access way beyond the perimeter of your network. Right. So these days, uh, people access your corporate resources in any kind of environment inside of your corporate network, outside of your corporate network, again, with various devices. And until now, there have been very limited uh, capabilities on uh, offering fine-grained and easy-to-use controls in those uh, spaces. So with that, I want to introduce to you uh, a product that we currently have in beta, which is the context-aware access that allows you to manage how people are accessing uh, your G Suite resources uh, with uh, varying levels of control. So as I said, the product is currently in beta. Some of you may already be familiar with it. Um, but in this case, uh, for example, uh, a person that accesses a uh, drive resource, you can uh, enable context-aware uh, context access. And by providing that uh, capability, you actually have the um, features where you can manage access either by IP subnet, device policy, or access level. So depending on the location of your users uh, or the devices that they use or the particular access control that, that you have uh, allocated to them, they now uh, can see whether or not um, that particular user has actually access. Um, inside of the network or as well as outside of the network. Okay, um, so just in closing, uh, with these additional tools that we provide, you can see how we're making it easier for you to control your environment, provide you a lot more control, um, as well as scale um, these features with essentially an always-on default protection. Thank you. So to summarize, Google's strength in security really comes from our scale. Google carries one-fourth of the Internet's overall traffic. With Android and Chrome, as well as Google Cloud Platform, we're able to see more, and hence we are able to build better machine learning models. We're able to better use this scale to protect our customers. We're very focused on the admin user journeys as they go from prevention, detection, and remediation of their security incidences. And I'm very grateful for Panos, Joey, and Mitch to be here today. We're all going to be waiting here. If you have any questions, please come back to us afterwards. With that, thank you. <laughs>